And we are now recording. She said, uh, for some reason, her calendar says 645, so she'll be joining. That's fine. Great. All right. It looks like people are starting to trickle in. Good evening. Hello. Come on in, come on in, come on in, everyone. We are going to get started in just about 90 seconds. We'll give people time to come on. So happy to have you all join us this evening for day one of the virtual CHW Summit. I don't know about you all, but... Oh, we're almost done with the day. <laughs> it's been some it's been some technical glitches, you know, as 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 can be expected. The platform is different. So um, you know, learning and development is always research and development. And so I'm I'm glad to have this experience. I think overall it still was a great day. So happy about that. So again, Welcome everyone. It's 6.33. We've got a lot of questions that we need to answer and content to review, so I want to go ahead and get started. My name is Quisha Umemba. I'm the CEO and founder of Umemba Health LLC. I'm so excited and so honored to be able to host the second annual Virtual Community Health Workers Summit. Uh, hello, Tasha. Welcome everyone. Come on in. Uh, please put uh, your name, where you're joining from, and if you have a question from one of the sessions today, Go ahead and pop that question in there too. We've got some questions that people have sent us throughout the day, but we will try to get to the questions that you load into the chat box as well. So I have with me uh, one of your special speakers and distinguished speakers rather from today's session, Miss Leonor Okwara. Hi, Leonor, how are you? Hey, Quisha, how are you doing? Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. Texas. Ohio. They're, they're, they're all over. They're yes. all over. Awesome. Looks like Denise is joining as well. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. um, had some really great feedback about your session and some really great questions. So I'm really excited for people to be able to connect with you one on one after viewing your um, your pre recorded session earlier. So um, can you hear us, Denise? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much again for joining. Uh, you also had a very informative, um, phenomenal presentation that was so well received. Lots of great comments um, and, and lots of great questions. Some of those we're going to dig into right now. So um, will we have the opportunity to see your face or are you going to stay off camera? I can't turn this? on my video. That's the same thing that Leonor said at first. Hold on just a second and let me make you a co-host and then that may help i'm not sure what happened i don't remember okay now your co-host i don't remember changing anything different from earlier today but hello everybody thanks for joining in so glad to have you this evening there you go looking lovely as usual um so quickly take 60 minutes and say who you are your organization what you do even though uh, hopefully most people have watched the the recording some people have not so just quickly, again, my name is Kwishu Umemba, CEO and founder of Umemba Health LLC, um, where we provide public health education and consulting primarily to community health workers, community health worker instructors, and the employers and organizations that employ them. Just a little bit about me. Leonor, if you would like to go next. Yeah, my name is Leonor Oquara. I am CEO and founder of Public Health Research Consulting. Um, I've been a researcher for a long time now, a lot of work in the community. And what I do is help researchers build trust with the community and the funder. I also host a podcast called Public Health Culture, where I talk about community engagement and public health initiatives, as well as research. So thank you, Quisha, so much. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. And Denise, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Denise Hernandez, and I uh, currently serve as the executive director of the Dallas-Fort Worth Community Health Worker Association. I also, I'm also on the board for the Texas Association of Promotores and Community Health Workers. And um, what I shared earlier today was some of the research I conducted on community health worker organizations meeting community health worker needs. And that was part of my dissertation research um, for UTA, where I currently teach in the public health program as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we'll just go ahead and get started with some questions directed towards you, Denise. Um, earlier, you shared some really great information on how employers um, could support CHW organizations. 
Um, so one of the questions that came in after that was, what kind of resources can employers provide to CHW organizations to actually support CHWs as it relates to professional development? I, I love this question because one of the things that I really want to um, try to do and encourage community health worker employers is to work in collaboration with community health worker organizations. We know that um, employers have a lot of other things going on where they can't, maybe they can't necessarily give all the attention that they need to their community health worker to meet their professional and social de uh, development needs. And so that's where they can partner with community health worker organizations to make sure that those needs are being met. Um, and so, uh, for example, I, I know Baylor in, in our region, they encourage uh, their CHWs to attend our meetings. And so they'll flex their schedule. Um, if they're going to attend our meeting, then they can take off half of the day or you know, they work with their community health workers. Some um, companies reimburse them for membership um, and really just encourage them to participate in our activities. And so that's one way that where I would really encourage employers or potential employers to collaborate with community health worker organizations. I love that. I love how you mentioned, you know, offering that time and flexing time so that they could um, do certain things. That also leads into a question that um, someone asked Leonor. And let me see if I can find the question here. It said, you set the primary goal in your presentation when we we're talking about particip participatory research is to build trust and relationships. Building relationships takes time. How do I get my employer to understand that I need time allotted to building relationships in my daily, weekly, monthly schedule, what have you? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So this is something that I've personally dealt with because my priority in research, I do boots on the ground work, recruiting for research studies. And if you're familiar with um, communities, a lot of them have a historical mistrust of researchers just because of the abuse they've experienced, um, you know, back in the day and even now. And so what I have learned um, first off is to be transparent with my employer or my research manager and let them know this is what's happening. I'm out here doing this work. This is the response of the community. So they can be um, aware of my every step that I'm taking to build trust, every step that I'm taking to build this relationship. And they can see that it doesn't happen overnight. The other thing is um, when it comes to long-term, you know, sustainability, when you have that goal of, of keeping that program up long-term and you talk to your employer about sustainability, if we want to develop relationships, if we want to have um, become that trusted resource, if we want to be able to just go into the community and invite them to do and to join in things that we are doing, we need to upfront dedicate the time to, um, to build relationships with them, to show up at different events, um, to make sure that we are inviting them to things that we are doing. So it isn't, there isn't an easy answer to that. It's just being transparent with what you're trying to do and also making sure that you emphasize the longevity of building relationships the right way up front. Because what will happen is if you take too, um, you go too fast, the community will kick you out and you know they're like, better luck next time. I'm not even gonna do anything. You know, anyone who comes into the community, I don't trust you. Um, so I think pitching it in that way, where building trust um, the right way will give you an end to the community long term. I like that. Thank you for that. I, I said something in, in my presentation earlier today where I was talking about CHW clinical integration, and I said, you know, CHWs have this light no trust factor. Um, and so that's so important. And I've heard you say show up. Like I, I listened to one of your latest podcasts that you were a guest on and I thought, how true is that? Just show up. If they're having events, you know, support those events, let them see you so that you can start um, being one of those trusted members of the community. So thank you for that. I'm going to ping pong now back to you, Denise. Um, so this actually, I'll be honest, this is a question from me. This did not come from anybody else. I, I'm curious to know this question. Uh, or this answer, there are over 4,000 CHWs that are certified in Texas, but less than 300 community health worker instructors 
So I want to know, do you personally feel that more CHW should be certified as instructors or not? And if so, what are some strategies that we can utilize to increase the number of CHW instructors? That's a loaded question. So dissect it how you want to. <laughs> well, I think that there, it, and I, I get asked the question of whether um, CHWs will ask me, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about getting my certification. Um, is it, do you recommend it? Do you think it's something I should pursue? And I always follow up with, well, what do you want to do with that instructor certification? Because in order for you to really use your instructor certification, you have to be affiliated with a CHW training center here in Texas, at least. And so if uh, your employer doesn't require that instructor certification, um, I, honestly, for me, I love teaching. And so for me, it was a natural transition. Um, and for those of you who enjoy being in a leadership position and, and like that teaching aspect thing, that's great. But as far as employment opportunities, we know that they're limited as it is for community health workers, um, at least fully funded CHW um, employment opportunities. Um, and I feel like there's even less for instructors. We also see less CEs available for instructors. Um, so those are even harder to come across. And so um, I, even though I think it's great, I think community health worker instructors are needed. Um, I really encourage people to think about what you want to do. Do you have a relationship with different training centers? Do you want to build curriculum? If anything, that's one of the, the things that is really needed is for um, if you're an, if you're interested in becoming an instructor and you have experience developing curriculum, then go for it because we need that. We need more um, a variety of topics. And so I do think that that there's a need there. But again, you have to be affiliated with uh, a training center. Not all training centers are able to pay community health worker instructors. And so um, you kind of have to weigh the, why am I doing this? Is it for money? Because um, that's, there's not a lot of it there with instructors. Or is it because I this is something I really enjoy and I see that there's a need for, which um, let's be honest with community health workers, a lot of it is because it's, it's in your heart, it's a passion. And so um, then if that's the case, then I definitely encourage people to become instructors. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really don't think that we need all CHWs to be uh, transitioning into instructors. I, I think we were, we need to take a, care of the instructors that we already have. Okay, well said. Well said. And I just want to reiterate, too, that um, I'm here in Texas. Denise is in Texas. Leonora is actually in Maryland. Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so when we reply, we may be speaking to what's going on here in Texas. And we do realize that um, the same things do not apply to all of the state. So if you're interested in knowing what's going on, you know, we invite you um, to investigate and, and see, you know, what's the status of individuals that are certified as CHWs versus those that are certified as CHW instructors. I haven't seen many areas where they're actually certifying or many states where they're actually certifying CHW instructors, um, personally myself. So while we're talking about instruction, there was a question that came through while you were presenting earlier that I thought, you know what, I'll just take that, um, that question later. Um, but Tony asked, are recognized diabetes education programs utilizing community health workers as para educators? And I wanted to reply then, and I thought, oh, I'll just wait till tonight. But yes, Tony, absolutely. In fact, when I first moved to, um, to Texas from Arkansas in 2015, it was to be the diabetes program manager uh, of the Houston Health Department. And so one of the first things that I had to do was hire a community health worker, two actually. And I had no idea what a community health worker was. I had never even heard of that term. Since then, I highly recommend any kind of community education program, whether it's diabetes, um, uh, cardiovascular, or, or hypertension, uh, anti-hypertension programs, any type of chronic disease self-management program, I actually really encourage that you utilize um, what you call paraeducators 
um, lay educators uh, or community health workers as well because again they have that like no trust factor and they're able to really get the education down on a level that the clients and the community members can understand so the answer to that question is yes it is very common if you'd like to know more about it please send me an email and we can talk about it great so i'm going to um, send another question your way leonor um, the question said you mentioned the hair project in your presentation that was implemented in beauty and barbershops how can i use my voice to start a similar initiative in my community yeah so if you guys want to know more about that initiative it's amazing if you haven't listened to um, my presentation but what i always love to tell people is don't reinvent the wheel so my recommendation to anyone wanting to start an initiative is see if it's being done in your community already because like we've been talking about building trust takes so long and if you can partner with another community who is already um a, a trusted figure that would work well for you and with chws oh my gosh like I am so passionate about it, especially working in research and um, partnering with outreach workers. Um, it has been such an amazing experience to see um, how well the community responds to people who know them and people they're familiar with and how they receive research information um, from trusted people. So my recommendation to you would be to see what's going on already and see if you can partner that way. If there isn't anything going on and you want to start something, that's when you have to just do it. You have to see what resources, what organizations in the area um, you can partner with and approach them with your idea and start from there. I love that. And, and you know, just a moment of transparency. Um, so uh, I know you and Denise know, but I got my COVID-19 injection this morning before the summit was not when I would have wanted it, but it's the only opportunity that I could have gotten, um, that, that I had to get the injection. And I got the injection because my black female ob -gen physician said, Quisha, I really recommend that you get this vaccination. Before then, I was still riding the fence. And so that's how important it is for you to be able to have someone that's you know in your corner on your team, whether it's in the clinical setting or the community, but someone that you can identify with, because there really is something about hearing information from trusted figures that look like you or, you know, that share those similar experiences as you. So I just wanted to share that and how it's so important. I've got a couple of questions for you, Denise. Someone earlier um, placed in the chat um, this comment and said, if actually it was one, one of my instructors, Devana. Um, she said, if volunteers are doing the work of CHWs, then organizations are likely to lean toward the free services provided by the volunteers instead of investing in a certified continuing, uh, a community health worker. How can this be remedied? I think, again, it goes back um, a lot to really educating those organizations. When you have volunteers um, and you're over-utilizing volunteers, it's going to lead to burnout. Um, your volunteers are eventually, uh, they're not going to want to volunteer for free anymore. There's um, high turnover rates as well with volunteers. And so there's no consistency. And when you're really trying to make an impact in the community and you're going for long-term projects, you want that consistency. You want that same group of community health workers or outreach workers to be the ones who are walking through this journey with the community. And so if you're constantly changing them, um, that you're really not kind of removing that accountability aspect from, from your program. Um, there's also studies that have shown the return on investment of community health workers. And so really making the case to those uh, volunteer organizations, um, the benefit of hiring community health workers helping them find those funding opportunities. Uh, one of the things that the association uh, is planning on doing in June is hosting an employer forum. And so what we're going to do, um, and we did this several years ago, but we really feel like it's, it's time to do it again, invite current and potential CHW employers, or maybe their organizations that um, have volunteer CHWs, 
and really show them, expose them to um, all the skill sets of a community health worker. What training do they receive? Kind of that CHW 101. Um, what skills do they have? How are they utilized in different ways? Um, we, we plan on having a panel of organizations that currently use CHW so they can talk about some of the challenges that they face because there are definitely challenges with incorporating community health workers. So what are some of those challenges um, and how, what has helped them overcome those challenges? Um, and so again, yeah, we know, we know CHWs and we really try to get away from the um, thinking, automatically thinking of volunteers when we hear the term community health workers, um, because it is a, a work that comes from the heart, then a lot of times we don't mind. We don't mind volunteering because we want to serve our community. But again, that leads to burnout, that leads to um, additional stress and turnover and um, other long-term mental health effects on the CHW. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're addressing those ahead of time as well. I don't, I don't even know. No, no, that was perfect. I was just, yeah, you answered the question. Thank you. I'm thinking that, you know, most helping professionals and, you know, my background is, is nursing first, but most helping professionals get caught in that trap. And so I have to tell myself all of the time, Quisha, you can make income and impact. You can make income and impact. You don't have to give everything away for free. Right. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that. And I also think that it, it, it volunteerism is, um, you know, very, it feels good, right? It makes you feel good. It, 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 it does something to you, especially if you're a helping person, but at what cost? Because when you're giving so much, giving so much, giving so much, um, you know, some days you need a little something that crinkles and clinkles in your pocket to make you feel good, not just people, you know, saying good job, thanks for your time today. So I'll leave it at that. I won't go Can any I further. Uh, I want to just add to that. Yeah, and I talk ahead. about this in my presentation, the value of CHWs. And a lot of researchers don't understand that. But those who do, like the research institution I work for, whenever we have volunteers, like for our community advisory board, or if we need input from them for focus groups or any information, we pay them. Yeah. So when you, you know, are approaching a university asking them if they have community advisory board opportunities for you because you are a community link, you should be expecting payment for your services. They want your expertise. That's this is something they you. don't have. Um, I so love I, you. Yeah, so make sure you advocate for yourself too. And please reach out to me if you have any questions about that. Yes, I'm so glad that you said that. I mentioned that in my talk and I'm, I'm not gonna actually ask it, ask the question, but someone was talking about, you know, um, CHWs being seen more as partners in the clinical setting. And and so I'm really a really big proponent of saying, you have a specialty, of course, like you're an expert at social determinants of health. You're an expert in the community that you represent and that you serve. Like people need to pay you for that. that that's not a $10, $12 an hour job. That's a lifetime of lived experiences, depending on how old you are. And yes, maybe you went and got a certification program, but ultimately that's a lifetime of lived experiences and people need to pay you for that experience. Yes. So I'm so glad that you said that. Last question, Denise, many people were really shocked today when you talked about how, you know, there's a, a fairly big um, number or a large number of CHWs that are actually allowing their certifications to lapse. I know I've talked about three in the last two weeks. Um, so um, speak to that and how can we, you know, how can we stop people from letting their certification lapse? Yeah, I think um, one of you know one of the really interesting um, things about the the results from my research, and I didn't really get too much into it during this presentation, um, was that member engagement in community health worker organizations was actually related to certification renewal rates. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with that social support, that social identity. Community health workers want to have relationships with other CHWs. They want a support network. They want um, an environment that really encourages them and advocates for them. Um, but they also want these professional development opportunities. And so um, it's really making sure that they're engaging in those activities um, to address those high uh, 
Turnover. Uh, yeah, those decreasing <laughs> renewal rates. It is shocking. I mean, we certified 900 CHWs, yet we still saw a decrease. It's, um, wow. it is very surprising, um, but we have to do more. Um, I've been approached a couple of times with um, uh, ideas for these grant opportunities to certify new community health workers. And, and I always say to them, let's think about the current community health workers that we have. Can we utilize them uh, instead of bringing in more community health workers, which I'm all for encouraging individuals to get their certification. I'm not against that at all, but we have such a large CHW workforce already. Let's pour into them. Let's build them up. Let's make sure that they're um, also satisfied in their role and they're, um, we're meeting their needs professionally and socially. Um, and so I think there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of collaborations that need to happen between organizations and training centers and DSHS and employers. Again, we're all currently working in silos and we need to work together. Um, the association is, uh, we partner with two different organizations, training centers that during their certification training, we come in and we share about our association and what we can do for them. We share about the state association and the national association. So they know that once they're done with their certification course, they're not alone. There are other resources. There are other community health workers here to help them. But I, get, I still get calls from other, um, from all over Texas asking me for resources. And my first question is always, how did you get my cell phone number? <laughs> but also, um, you know, let me put you in contact with someone in your community that may be more familiar and can help you. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's just a lot of work to be done in supporting community health workers. Wow. And, and you know, to me, it just makes sense. You know, when I became a nurse, I joined the nursing association. When I got my certification in diabetes education, I joined that association. When I got certified to be a CHW instructor, I just joined you know, the National Association of Community Health Workers, because it's it's how you stay in the know. It's how you stay connected and informed of those educational and continuing um, uh, professional development opportunities. So, ladies, if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and end tonight's live Q&A. I don't have any questions that have uh, come in. I've got a couple of comments. Again, I thank all of you for joining us. Um, this is a wonderful day, a lot of great information. I'm so excited for the remainder of the summit. I'm gonna go ahead and do the drawing before we end today. Um, but if nothing else, thank you so much, uh, Denise and Leonore. You are so appreciated. Your contributions um, are, are, are invaluable. So thank you again for your time and expertise. Alrighty, so just to remind you of um, the drawing, it's the same one that we had earlier today. One lucky winner is gonna get uh, this book, Promoting the Health of the community, community health workers describing their roles, competencies, and practice, as well as a $50 gift certificate to UH Academy merchandise and apparel online. So let me pull up our spin the wheel here. And I went ahead and added the individuals that enrolled or registered for the summit today. So everybody has been included. Let's see who this evening's lucky winner is. Congratulations, Catherine Tika. You will be getting an email from me with instructions on how to redeem your prizes. You did not have to be live um, to participate. So if nothing else, everyone, please have a good evening. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you all tomorrow evening.